Southern New England's trusted news source, ABC6 News at Noon. Hey there, folks. Thanks for joining us today for ABC6 News at Noon. I'm Casey Kance. We're going to start today with the weather and a live look outside right now on this lunch hour. Let's see what's, uh, what things are looking like out there. Pretty cloudy to start uh, this uh, noon lunch hour, but what is coming in later tonight uh, is what we're more concerned about right now. We're going to let Nick Morganelli tell us more about that right now. Nick, catch us up, man. What's up? Yeah, thanks, KC. Uh, yeah, we got rain on the way. It's just a couple more dry hours, and this is the way that sky cam looked this morning. Beautiful sunrise, and we caught the, uh, it, it lit up the under, underbellies of the clouds. Uh, beautiful pink and orange this morning. And now here comes the rain. Look at the leading edge of it. It's snow. And uh, it is uh, starting to snow in uh, western Massachusetts, the northwest hills of Connecticut. Uh, it has some rain from New Haven to Stamford, Connecticut, Danbury, Connecticut, raining, uh, New York City as well. Let's zoom in a little closer here and we'll take a look. And you can see just that northern fringe is a little strip of snow or mixed precipitation. We might see a wet snowflake maybe by Smithfield, Woonsocket, Foster. Uh, maybe just a little bit there, but for the most part, it's uh, going to be very quick. It's quickly going to turn over to rain. It's 41 in Providence right now. It's 39 in Smithfield, 42 in New Bedford. And the rain begins between 2 and 4 o'clock. The heaviest will be between 7 o'clock and midnight. And the rain ends late night, probably around 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. It'll wind down. So the wind is not an issue with the storm. The morning and early afternoon hours tomorrow will have some light snow showers uh, and it shouldn't accumulate too much because the temperatures will be above freezing. But here's five o'clock, not much rain falling. So this afternoon it's just light rain. But after five o'clock, then it starts to ramp up. So between six and 11, we get a good half an inch of rain. And look, between 11 and 2 a.m., another half an inch. So you see how hard it's going to rain here uh, late night tonight near the midnight hour. Futurecast shows that, just light showers here, uh, upper 30s at 5 o'clock, and there's all the yellows and some pockets of orange on the radar forecast. That's uh, moderate is yellow and, uh, and the darker green, and then the heaviest is orange and red. And you see we've got temperatures in the 30s, holding in the 30s all night, which mid to upper 30s too. And then there's that snow shower. Look at 7 a.m. It's out in the Berkshires and uh, western Mass, western Connecticut. It slides in on top of us during the midday hours. So sometime in the morning tomorrow to midday, uh, we'll get a few snow showers in here. Weekend's looking pretty good after we get through this. We'll talk more about that in the seven day coming up. We will check back in, Nick. Thank you for that. Trending now, a Thanksgiving tradition is no more in Somerset and Swansea, and there are plenty of people unhappy about it. ABC 6 News reporter Natalie Nuri has been following the story for us. She joins us live from Somerset this afternoon with details. Natalie, about a new petition that's quickly gathering signatures. Tell us more about this. That's right, KC. A social media firestorm is now brewing after a decision was made to cancel a traditional and almost century old high school football game here in Bristol County, Massachusetts. This Thanksgiving Day football game between Case High School and Somerset Berkeley has been a long standing tradition for both schools. People I spoke with say in recent years, possibly because of school population, the level of competition has become unfair, where the games have become blowouts in Somerset's favor. A petition is now circulating on the internet with nearly 1,500 signatures to save the game and keep the tradition going. The former Somerset Berkeley High School principal spoke with me today sharing his thoughts. What we would like to see is dialogue. Let's open up dialogue on how this tradition can be preserved, saved, without simply unilaterally eliminating it. I also reached out to Case High School to figure out why they made the decision to move on from this tradition, but we'll have more from them tomorrow on ABC6 News at noon. For now, reporting live in Somerset, I'm Natalie Norrie, ABC6 News. All right, Natalie, thank you. Now to an ABC6 News update today. New developments in the investigation into that deadly shooting during filming of the Alec Baldwin movie Rust. Prosecutors with an announcement regarding charges in the death of the movie's cinematographer Helena Hutchins, ABC's Tim Pulliam, live in Santa Fe, New Mexico today with the latest.
Santa Fe prosecutors announcing involuntary manslaughter charges for actor Alec Baldwin and crew member Hannah Gutierrez Reed in that deadly 2021 shooting on the movie set of Rust. Two counts each. The film's assistant director, Dave Halls, took a plea deal admitting negligence. He will serve six months probation. The shooting, killing cinematographer Helena Hutchins, striking her in the chest and injuring director Joel Souza. I need some help. I was director and our camera woman has been shot. In 2021, the Oscar nominee in an exclusive interview with George Stephanopoulos described the moment Hutchins was shot, saying he never pulled the trigger. And I cocked the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, no, no. But the FBI released a report last August concluding the gun used on set when fully cocked could not have fired without pulling the trigger while the working internal components were intact and functional. Baldwin's lawyer at the time said the FBI's findings were misconstrued and that the gun was in poor condition. How that live round got into the gun in the first place. Do you think we're going to find out? We may. But I think that one of the most important things that happened was your interview with him. I think that it was devastating for him that he said he never pulled the trigger. And then an FBI report indicated that that uh, is very unlikely. Last November, Alec Baldwin filed a lawsuit against several crew members, including the film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, for giving him the gun, for failing to check the bullets or the gun carefully. Now, her attorney fired back, saying that Baldwin is the sole person responsible for this incident. He rejected training. He pointed the gun, pulled the trigger without the armorer being present. Tim Pulliam, ABC News, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Checking in on more of today's headlines. Big news here today. Colonel Hugh Clements has found his new job after leaving the Providence Police Department. He'll be joining the Department of Justice. Clements will become the director of the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services, also known as the COPS Office. Uh, his role basically will be to advance the practice of community policing of the nation's state, local, territorial, and tribal law enforcement agencies through information and grant resources. Seekonk Police Chief Dean Isabella will be former Chief Isabella as of tomorrow. The Seekonk Select Board voting last night to remove the Chief from his position after putting him on leave earlier this month, citing a need for, as they call it, directional shift in department leadership. Isabella said the board's actions have harmed his reputation, personal health, and mental well-being. He's expected to sue the town. Newly elected Bristol County Sheriff Paul Harrow announcing a proposal to close the Ash Street Jail in New Bedford. Advocates have been calling for the jail to be shut down for years, pointing to high suicide rates and lousy conditions inside. In his proposal, Harrow wants to retrofit the former ICE detention facility in Dartmouth to house the Ash Street inmates. That's a 200,000 square foot building. This is a 16,000 square foot building. If we can replicate that uh, over here, uh, because we're not using that entire 200,000 square feet, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. But we're responsible for the upkeep of it alone. I mean, it would be the initial upfront investment, but that will pay for itself over the course of time because that's expensive to maintain. The Ash Street Jail has been open since the late 1800s. It is the oldest operating jail in the country. 96 inmates currently there. Haro wants to build out 120 cells in the Dartmouth facility. A grisly discovery in Barrington on Wednesday. The body of a man found by the water near the Ripta Park and Ride lot on County Road. At this time, police telling us they don't suspect foul play. The state's medical examiner will determine the cause of death. As part of a plea agreement, Ronald Andrewchuk of Burrowville admitted to a federal judge he made false statements while buying hundreds of guns and was illegally in possession of more than 200 of them. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Rhode Island, in February, police were called to Andrew Chuck's home to investigate reports of shots fired. Police ultimately found more than 200 guns and drugs. The Massachusetts man accused of murdering his wife and discarding her body in court yesterday, charged now with murder. Prosecutors say Brian Walsh killed and dismembered his wife, Anna, and disposed of her body in various dumpsters. They say he wanted to end their marriage. Attorney General Peter Nerona, meantime, announcing charges against Barletta Heavy Division, Inc. This is the company behind the 610 construction project. They're being charged for allegedly dumping thousands of tons of contaminated fill at project sites in Providence. The company charged with two counts of illegal disposal of solid waste, one count of operating without a license, and providing a false document to a public official. The superintendent of the project, 62-year-old Dennis Ferreira, faces the same charges. 
there were a number of instances where workers on the site and, and state officials on the site noticed the change in the material that was arriving there. And so based on that, um, they alerted, you know, uh, investigators. And so over the course of the last two years or so, we've worked with our federal counterparts at the U.S. Attorney's Office and federal officials to investigate this matter. Now all parties involved will appear in Superior Court next month. Still to come today on ABC6 News, at new, new documents further calling into question the veracity of George Santos's resume as he remains defiant in Congress. We have the new details today. And later, the items taken from the Idaho murder suspect's apartment now reveal the update from investigators about that case coming up. Welcome back. Checking political news today. New York Congressman George Santos facing new allegations of additional lies on his resume, saying his mother was in one of the towers on 9-11 when she wasn't. ABC's Jay O'Brien has the latest. I wish you guys all a This morning, day. new I questions swirling again around the background of Congressman George yes, Santos. Am. The New York Republican already accused of defrauding voters now facing a new round of unearthed claims. On a podcast in 2021, Santos said his mother's death was linked to debris from ground zero. My mom was a 9-11 survivor. Mm. She was in the South Tower, um, and she made it out. She got caught up in the ash cloud. My mom fought cancer till her death. But immigration documents obtained by Alex Calzera through a Freedom of Information Act request and provided to ABC News suggest Santos's mother wasn't even in the United States on that day. George Santos has essentially lied about every aspect of his life. He has essentially pretended to be a biracial, Ukrainian, Belgian, Brazilian, volleyball champion and brain cancer survivor whose mother died twice, including on 9-11. The freshman congressman also under fire for allegations that he has ties to a Ponzi scheme in Florida, faces charges of check fraud in Brazil and even allegedly used a different name to set up a GoFundMe to raise $3,000 for a veteran's dying dog and then never handed over the money. I took his help and needed it. I needed that dog to survive. Santos has denied those allegations, telling reporters he has no clue who this is. And while admitting to resume embellishments, has broadly insisted he's done nothing unethical or illegal. I've worked my entire life. I've lived an honest life. I've never been uh, accused, sued, of, of any m bad doing. Republican House leadership not pushing Santos out, now assigning him to two low-profile congressional panels, the Small Business Committee and the Science, Space, and Technology Committee.
There are a growing number of House Republicans calling for Santos to resign, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has signaled he wants to handle this issue internally and wait for the results of an ethics committee investigation. Jay O'Brien, ABC News, Washington. And so to come today on ABC 6 News at noon, we'll check back in with Nick Morganelli. He's got a full check of that seven-day forecast. He's looking at some possible snow. We'll check in with him next. And now, your ABC6 Storm Tracker weather with meteorologist Nick Morganelli. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we've got the rain on our doorstep, so just maybe another hour or so for dry weather. And uh, we'll take you through this afternoon. Two o'clock, we start to get some light showers. Five o'clock, a steady rain. Uh, can be moderate at times during the evening commute. Then it becomes heavy, eight o'clock to 11 o'clock. And until it ends around uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. So uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, no wind uh, really much associated with this storm system. That's not a factor here, but uh, we've got the rain developing. It's a 12-hour storm, uh, give or take a little bit, and heavy at times tonight. It's a dry weekend on our weather headlines. The next rain is Sunday night and Monday morning. That will be rain once again. Temperatures in the 40s. And then it's seasonally cold next week. Little pattern change, I think, the end of the week. And there's a, we're watching a midweek storm. And right now, this is what the track looks like. This is Wednesday. And why am I going all the way out to Wednesday? Well, it's on the seven day forecast. So you'll see that in just a minute. But this track right here would take the low again right over us. So we stay right on the edge of that mild air. Uh, if it tracks just a little farther to the south, then we get a little bit colder. So we'll have to watch that very carefully. I'll have more details on that tomorrow morning, starting at 5 a.m., and we'll uh, show you the different tracks and how that would work out. Here's uh, the uh, radar right now, not showing anything over us, but just to the west. It is raining here. We've got a rain snow line setting up right through the Litchfield Hills of Connecticut and then right through Hartford and uh, edging probably right through northwestern corner of Rhode Island as it continues to come in. And you can see that moisture pushing in. It's going to uh, take another hour or two to moisten up the lower atmosphere. It's pretty dry out there in the lower level layers of the atmosphere. The sun is actually dimly visible right now, which tells me that the overcast is pretty thin. Uh, so here's the future cast showing that warm front. This is a uh, noon time. We'll take you through the afternoon. It pushes closer to us and it brings in the rain. And then this secondary low pressure system develops. This uh, will enhance the precipitation here. Uh, for this evening. So 8 o'clock to about 
midnight, we're going to see a moderate to heavy rain. This is 1030, and then it moves through. We continue with the cool weather. Tomorrow, we're on the back side of this with the other low pressure system coming in. So you get a few snow showers here uh, during the day tomorrow. How much? Uh, not really anything. Uh, maybe a coating in the northern parts of Rhode Island, but uh, we're really looking at warm air temperatures, and the ground is warm as well. Uh, it's going to have a hard time sticking, so I wouldn't uh, count on any seeing any white stuff on the ground. 36, moderate to heavy rain tonight. 34 tomorrow with the light snow, little or no accumulation expected. And here's that seven day. Weekend's pretty nice. Breezy on Saturday. It's a chilly day. 36 for the high. 40 on Sunday, so that gets a little bit better. And then Sunday night, the clouds come in. Rain Sunday night and Monday. And then Monday's rain is before noontime. I think it dries out in the afternoon. And then Tuesday's dry. And then we'll watch that storm for next Wednesday and uh, see if that storm track changes. I'll have important information on that again and an update tomorrow. Casey? I called that a super tease this morning. We got that yeah. circled now. <laughs> All right, okay. Nick, thank you for that. Still to come today on ABC6 News. And we're going to head back to Idaho for an update there on that investigation of the murders of four college students. Stay with us. Back with an update today in new developments in the Idaho College murders case. Officials releasing the affidavit for Brian Koberger's Washington apartment where investigators seized more than a dozen items. ABC's Mola Lange has those details. This morning, the items taken from Idaho suspect Brian Koberger's apartment now revealed. Unsealed court documents showing that on December 30th, during their raid, investigators seized stained bedding, including a pillow with a reddish brown mark, possible strands of hair, a dust container from a vacuum, a black glove, receipts from Walmart and Marshalls, a computer tower, a fire TV stick, and a possible animal hair strand, but no weapon. Please be seated. Koberger charged with four counts of murder for the deaths of Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin on November 13th. He has not entered a plea. In the affidavit for his arrest, police say they found DNA that tied him to the crime scene. And now, in these newly unsealed warrants, they say they were looking for any evidence of the victims or their dog in Koberger's belongings. Kaylee Gonsalves' dog, seen in these TikTok videos, was found inside of the home the day after the murders in a separate room from the victims. Arcana Whitworth previously asking detectives about it. How important is the behavior of the dog in your investigation? We don't believe that there was any appearance of force entry into the home. What we do know is that the dog was inside when officers arrived. The dog did not appear to have any evidence on it. Well, Koberger is not due back in court until June, and he's currently being held in Idaho without bail. Mola Lange, ABC News, Denver.
And welcome back to ABC 6 at noon. Uh, winter weather advisory just to the north of Rhode Island, uh, Worcester County, and most of western Massachusetts, north, eastern and northwestern Connecticut until uh, Friday at 6 o'clock. They're going to have some snow there. We've got a little snow, maybe wet flakes on the front side of this, but we're going to get rain from this system, and we're almost there. We've got another hour and a half or so before we start to see raindrops. The weekend looks good. Sunshine and clouds after tomorrow's uh, snow showers. It's 36 and breezy on Saturday, 40 on Sunday. A little bit better there, a little less wind and more sunshine. Casey? All right, Nick, thank you for that. Thank you, folks, for watching today. The news continues first at 4. We're always online, too, at abc6.com. I'm Casey Kance. Have a great rest of your Thursday.